Welcome to Casual Conversations. This is our 40th episode, and I am so excited today to have NECA McGregor with me. Hello, NECA. Hi, Catherine. Good afternoon. And can you tell us where you are calling in from today? I would love to tell you. Um, I want to acknowledge that I'm calling in uh, this lovely afternoon from Takaronto, which is the indigenous name for Toronto. I am very, very, very privileged to be coming to you from land belonging to the Haudenosaunee, the Huron-Wendat, the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe and the Chippewa. And I think it's important uh, as a settler, an uninvited guest on indigenous land to constantly lead with gratitude for their stewardship of this land. Uh, I call myself um, an uninvited tenant on their land. I've been here for about 30 years and the rent that I pay for living, breathing, having raised my children on indigenous land, the rent I pay is to constantly show up as an, an accomplice, right? Uh, an ally to indigenous peoples and their struggles for um, justice uh, across, across Turtle Island, Canada. Thank you so much. And I remember the first time um, I met you and you introduced yourself in that way. And it really profoundly changed the how I think about uh, the land that I live on and the peoples were here. And I actually started doing some research. So um, uh, Australians also, um, many of the Australians that I work with in academia also um, present. So welcome. And there's so many things to talk about with you. What I wanted to start with was the piece that really I didn't know much about. I wanted to know about your, where you were born, your childhood, where you first started out being NECA. <laughs> um, I love to talk about this, obviously, because it's, you know, we all love to talk about ourselves. Um, I'm Nigerian by birth and by ancestry, very, very proud. Um, my tribe is the Igbo tribe of uh, Eastern Nigeria. And I was born, born in, the, in Nigeria in 1963. I just had my 59th birthday on January 25th. I just want to put it out there because I'm constantly celebrating myself. Um, but I was born in, in 1963. And then a couple of years after that, there was a civil war. My dad, had left the left Nigeria in the Christmas December of, of 62 to go to England to study law. And so he left my mother and my two sisters, my older sisters who were twins, and my older brother and myself. And um, which is why my mother name, named me Neka. And the name Neka actually means loosely translated that your mother rocks. <laughs> Right. And she said that the, the reason she named me that is that fathers can get up and go and, you know, do all sorts of stuff. But your mother is the grounding, which I, I absolutely agree. Um, anyway, so she she stayed behind until around 1960, 65. And then she went to England to on vacation to visit my dad. And uh, then the war, as I said, the Civil War broke out. And then in 68, I think my sisters, my brother and I were, we managed to um, escape Nigeria, the, the civil war. And so we, we, I came to England at the age of four or five as a refugee and digression, but a lot of the work that I do now is really being mindful of migration, right? And, and understanding that people are forced to leave their land right, their, their homes to go somewhere else because of insecurity of some sort. And so I always ask people to be really respectful and really compassionate around refugees and migrants um, because I was one. So uh, we went to England where I was raised, hence the accent. Um, and so my sisters, my brother, my brothers, my, my parents had a, another child, my delicious younger brother, in England in 1966. So all of us grew up in the UK. I talk about it as a England, right? It's, it's the land of the colonizer and uh, quite racist. So I grew up in a very racist environment, but was raised by a, uh, an amazing father. My dad was, I talk about him as the first feminist 
that I ever met who raised five children in racist England um, from around 19, early 1970s because my mother passed away when I was 11, 12. So I was raised by a single dad and he was, he was just flipping amazing and believed in gender equity and girls could do anything the boys can do. So I, I, I sort of grew up feeling badass <laughs> right? that I can do anything that my brothers can do because my dad said so. Um, and how I got into this work was because I, I went to university to study law, like my daddy, and met my, who, the fellow who became my husband and the father of my children, but experienced all forms of, of gender-based violence in that relationship, um, even when we were in England. And when we moved to Canada in 19... 92, the, it continued, right? And it continued up until 2002, when I decided, you know what, enough is enough, right? This is, this is very, very dangerous. By then we'd had three children who I call my three wishes because they are just phenomenal human beings. We'd had three kids and um, I was constantly sort of thinking about what was a message that my children were receiving from the violence. And whilst they didn't see it all, all the time, but it was in the house, right? It was in the house. And I, I didn't want my daughters to think that this is the way women, you know, human beings should be treated. And I didn't want my son to think that this is the way to treat women. So in 2002, uh, started divorce proceedings and as always happens, as usually happens in these relationships, separation begets increase in violence. And so on uh, Mother's Day of all days, Mother's Day 2003 was the last physical assault where I, again, how I got into brain, brain injury was I, he um, pounded my head on the floor and uh, I was also experienced strangulation and loss of consciousness. And so I, I just wanted to do something with that experience. I didn't want to hide in a corner. I never felt ashamed of being a survivor because I didn't do anything. I, I wasn't the person who was, you know, perpetrating the violence. So I never understood why survivors were made to feel ashamed for the violence that was vis visited on them. But um, yeah, so in 2002, when the divorce started, the violence escalated and uh, the Mother's Day incident happened. He was arrested, charged, criminal legal system got involved and we were navigating, I, I found myself navigating three um, very, very traumatic systems, legal systems. One was a criminal legal system where my children and I had to testify. There was a family court because we were fighting for custody, access, equalization. And then there was a civil court because we owned a company together and he was refusing to share anything. And so I had all my family, I had no supports in Canada, all my family was in England. And um, my dad would say to me, you need to do something that doesn't get you into mischief. <laughs> don't 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 do anything that gets you into mischief. So I, I enrolled to do my master's of law at uh, um, York University Osgoode Hall, and it was whilst I was doing my master's that I sort of fell into advocacy, social justice advocacy, because there was um, an organisation called the Women Abuse Council of Toronto, and they were looking for people to help with a court watch, court watch program where you'd go to court and monitor the criminal legal system, the criminal um, domestic violence trials. And I thought, I can do that. That's not getting into mischief. That's using my, my skills to do something constructive. And from the time I met the ED, wonderful woman, Vivian Green of, of the Woman Abuse Council, she introduced me to a group of other survivors and they were called the Accountability Committee, where it was like a, a 13 survivors who would sort of feed into the work of this um, gender-based violence, violence against women organization to provide an input, et cetera, et cetera. And from, the, from that first meeting, I thought I have found my calling. 
this is what I was meant to do, not archaeology, which is what I thought I would be doing when I was six, but this is really what I was meant to do. And so since then, like 2004, I haven't, I haven't looked back. In 2008, I actually incorporated the organization with Vivian, um, and it became the very first um, survivor-led, survivor-centered, organized nonprofit that's by and for specifically women, trans, and gender diverse survivors of all forms of gender-based violence. Because I wanted a space for all of us survivors to get together and to talk, right? And use our lived experience of the violence as a way to create real systemic change based on our expertise. We are the experts. We are the experts. With all due yeah. respect to academics, we are the experts. Did anything exist like that at, at that level in Toronto at the time? Nothing, nothing in Canada. Um, and actually at the time of incorporation, because I did a, a scan, there was nothing like that in the world where it was by and for survivors. And like I said, when I first started to say you're a survivor, it was stuff that people whispered, right? But I, 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 I owned it. I, I walked into the room, with my red lipstick and my red nails. And I said, I'm a survivor and I'm the expert and you need to listen. And people did. I don't know whether it was the accent. <laughs> the accent gets through <laughs> a lot of- It, it is an incredible things. accent, but um, and d did you have pushback? Like, well, you know, you all X, Y, Z, and you know, there needs to be sub academic running this in some way. Was, was there pushback or did, was it all smooth sailing? Uh, nothing is ever smooth sailing, especially <laughs> when it's being led by a black woman. It's never smooth sailing. And so the resistance that I got and people, people if you don't know me by now, you, you, you will, it very little phases me, very little. I don't take, once I've decided that this is what I want to do, very little, um, there's no, the resistance is futile, as the Borg would say, there's no point. I've decided, and this is what we're doing, and this is what we do. So people initially were, um, it was almost territorial, right? They felt that if you give survivors space, if you give them a voice, then they're going to take over. And I have a philosophy, this is my thesis in, in life, that we are meant to be doing the work so that people will sort of get themselves unemployed, right? It's not, it's not meant to be a career. We're supposed to be doing this so that violence against women and trans and you know, gender diverse, it ends. So that we don't need shelters anymore. We don't need you know, that type of intervention. But what I found was that it, it was as if I was encroaching on people's livelihoods, right? On their abilities to pay their mortgage by saying that survivors needed to be at the center. And, and I, I didn't care about that because what kept on um, circulating in, was the sense of urgency. I nearly died. I nearly died on Mother's Day in front of my three children, 15 years, 10 and five. And I, I realized as we're speaking now, right? Today, women are being murdered. Women and their children are being murdered. And so the sense of urgency was something that I didn't have time to hear, listen to anybody telling me why it couldn't work and all that. No, if you, I need to know how we can make it work, right? So if you've got something to share about how we can make it work, come on board. But if you're going to start telling me this one worked, this I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't have time, the energy, the patience, the inclination to get involved in that. And and people very soon got on board, right? Because they knew Neck is not here for that. You you have to get on board or step out of the way. Absolutely, absolutely. No time. <laughs> and what uh what what did you find? What was the the government uh support or uh you know barriers? What were you supported by the Canadian government at the time for what what was um, happening? Yeah, in the beginning, the very first grant that we received was in two thousand and nine. 20, 2009, 2010, and it was from the provincial government, the government of Ontario, um, from a, the department called the um, Ontario Women's Directorate. And there's a lesson that I, because I, 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 every time I talk, I think about nuggets and lessons to share. 
the biggest lesson I've learned around that is about relationship building, right? Because the ED of the executive director of that organization, her name is Susan Thebe. I flipping well love that woman. Susan Thebe heard me speak at some event and something ignited in her. And she wanted to figure out a way that the, they could support. So she gave us a grant of $50,000. Um, 30,000 was supposed to be my salary because I, I wasn't on a salary. I didn't have a salary. 30,000 was my salary. 10,000 was towards rent. And 10,000 was for Vivian who was doing sort of community. Viv, Vivian is not a, a survivor, but she's been in the, in the GBV sector for you know, decades. So she got 10,000, we got 10,000 for rent and 30,000 was for my salary. It quickly became evident that the rent was $25,000. So <laughs> where did that money come from? It had to come from my salary. So for years, I've been supplementing the work. Actually, it's my kids who've been paying my rent so that I could, I could be doing this. But yeah, the, the provincial government, that's how they started supporting us. And it's only really in 2016 when the federal government got in charge, uh, got involved. And again, I, I talk about relationships. I've, I've been cultivating my relationships with the government because I need people to hear me. I need them to understand what it is that we're doing and ways that they can support. And it's not just about signing a check. You need to implement the policy changes that we're, we're coming up with, because that's where the change um, really, really happens. So yeah, the government, the federal government has been incredibly supportive, I'll, I'll say that. Um, the, the, the department is called the Department for Women and Gender Equality, WAGE, flipping amazing group of women, and um, have provided funding for several really high level um, pieces of innovative work that Women at the Center has done. One around um, transformative justice, for example, finding an alternative model for uh, survivors of sexual violence who don't want to navigate the criminal legal system because the criminal legal system is not a site for healing, it's not a site for justice, it's not a site for accountability. So transformative justice, which comes from um, Black women, trans women, activists in the States, as a model that we've sort of um, adapted. Then we were funded uh, recently to do work on human trafficking, right? And as an organization by and for survivors, that particular initiative is being led by survivors of human trafficking oh, to create resources, etc. And then Catherine, I have to share very quickly, we got uh, a pot of money a lot for us, $2.5 million last February, um, over five years to, and it's the first of its kind, as far as we can tell, again, globally, um, where government has put money, dedicated money to, the title is Advancing Gender Equity for Black Women, Black Girls, and Black Gender Diverse People in the Canadian Context. Because again, recognizing that Black women, Black girls, and Black gender, Black trans communities have been erased Right? There's no data on our experiences of violence. There's no data on our experiences with, with the child welfare system, criminal, no data at all. And so we got this funding last year, over five years to engage and then develop what we're calling the Amogenoir framework. And Amogenoir is, um, if you know the word um, misogyny, obviously, and misogynoir, which was a term coined by Dr. Moya Bailey, beautiful, brilliant black woman, to talk about the intersection of anti-black racism and gender. So if you are black and a woman, there's a particularity of the experiences, right? The, the racism that you, you receive, which is different from black and men or different from white and women. So black women have at this intersection, again, similar to uh, Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw's um, terminology of intersectionality. So for us, it's a way of, Amogenoir is a way to disrupt um, misogynoir and center black women, black girls and black gender diverse peoples in policy, in programming. And uh, again, doing it in a way that is responsive to the needs of the difference, the others, indigenous women and other racialized women. 
So very excited, very, very excited about all this work. And that was my, my next question was, what changes have you seen in the last 10 years that feel that, you know, society is changing and that the, the, the non-existent of Black women, no data, and now this, this grant, um, you know, it's not moving fast enough, but where are we, you know, where are you with how fast it's going and like, 10 years ago to now, like, yeah. and then the next 10 years, like, yeah. where are we on this pathway that you see? Yeah, and I just saw a note from Nat Dean about um, people living with disabilities. Absolutely brilliant. I, I always talk about that, right? And how there is a, I have a lovely friend, Bonnie Brayton, who is the ED of an organization in Canada called Disabled Women's Network, Dawn Canada. And Bonnie talks about how disabled, um, communities are like a, a comma, they're a byline in all of this work and how important it is to center them. So brilliant point, Nat, really well taken. Catherine, back to your question about where, you know, how far has the pendulum swung and how further is it going to, I think it's, look, I am, I am one of those people who, you know, the Disney princess that wakes up in the morning and she sings and the birds are singing with her. That's, that's me. I, I, I am an eternal optimist, right? I, am, I, I live with hope. I move with hope. And so I, I, I answer this question about shifts with hope because I've seen the difference. I've seen how things have shifted. It's not as fast as I would like, but I recognize that these systems are in, you know, entrenched with then insert you know, misogyny, mis anti-black racism, they're, they're in, embedded in it. So it'll take a minute to shift, to unpack, right? To disrupt, that's the word I keep using, disrupt and reconstruct. But I can see the shift. Otherwise I wouldn't, I wouldn't wake up. I wouldn't get up in the morning, put on my lipstick and come in and have these conversations if I didn't see the shift happening. Um, in terms of where I want to see it move, I want to see more marginalized people, people, um, like myself, black women, um, black trans women, right? Young youth, young people, um, people who have been minoritized. I want to see our voices more centered in this stuff, right? In this, all of this work, because to continue with the status quo, things being, you know, you have the group who are constantly being listened to. We need to we need to have new vo new voices, right? Fresh faces at the table and bring fresh perspectives if, if things are really going to shift and stay shifted. And I think if we talk about brain injury as a space, I mean it it it, it has been dominated by white men. It, it I think it has been it's sort of the ugly stepchild of the whole neurology field. Um, sort of late, you know, late funded. Um, there isn't a pharmaceutical that cures brain injuries. There's just not a lot of investment. The investment doesn't go very far. People come and go, um, you know, and so in that space, trying to find, and certainly as an organization, Pink Concussions, you know, it was very clear that most of our support groups were white and that when I had patient panels, they were white panels of women with health insurance of a certain economic piece. And, and from a point of cultural, well, I didn't know the word cultural humility, um, Monique, um, but I think it was like four years ago, suggested that maybe I did a little education. And, and, and I, you know, from a place where I thought I was aware to cultural humility and realizing how much I'm aware of nothing and then just kind of digging back in um, to trying to find a way to use the privilege that I have as a white woman to create spaces, not only because it's the right thing to do, but the richness, the, I mean, if we want to know about grit, um, uh, resilience, you know, how to move forward in adversarial conditions. Um, if you don't have black women in your life, you're missing out on a huge value of, um, you know, amazing experiences. 
Yeah, which is why I, I have to tell everybody that's listening uh, how much I love Catherine because, and I genuinely, I talk about, I have girl crushes in my life and um, Angela Colantonio and Lynn Hogg, and you know them, are two of my favorite girl crushes. But Catherine is in that, in that crowd, in that, in that company, because for the Pink X uh, conference, Catherine, you reached out and you said, I'm a white woman and I don't think it's right for me to be moderating the panel of black women. And I thought that is such a thoughtful, right? That is such a, a reflective, thoughtful um, position for somebody to, you know, look around and think, yeah, this, th there's something not quite right with that picture and then reach out. So I was really moved and really touched by it. And then when, when I met the panelists, it's, it's magic, right? And I, I, if I'm talking about any black woman in this room, in this space right now, will know what I'm talking about. When you are in, in company with other black women and there is this beautiful energy, right? Because I don't have to go into anything for you to understand what it is that I'm saying. You don't have to go into anything. So when I met them, right, especially the, the first um, panel of survivors who had experienced um, TBIs or brain injuries, the first time we met, it was as if we we'd been we knew each other for for you know decades. It was as if we were all sitting in my kitchen drinking Chardonnay and just catching up. It was it was a beautiful thing, and so I think that's the magic that showed up in the panel. Right and and being feeling safe or safer in the company of other black women that we're not going to judge each other. We understand what each other's experiences are, and in that sense of safety was what made you know, makes people relax and then open up. So that's what comes across. Um, that's what I felt, and I think that's what comes across in in the the recordings. So, but again, it, it needed white women in positions of privilege to step aside, right? To recognize their privilege, step aside and say, go do your stuff. And then we did, and we we made magic. You absolutely made magic. And, and, and just in the journey that I've had with, you know, no special degree, no special family name, no, no, no money to start pink concussions, um, it was essentially white men that used their privilege to open, uh, you know, give me a stage. Uh, Dr. Ray Mitchell gave me Georgetown University Medical Center stage. And I remember it saying, pulling him up going, oh, I want you to like open this. He's like, it's your, you know, like, so those spaces were made for me all the way along. Um, women were always incredibly supportive, um, but sometimes those, breaks I had were, were men who, who with that privilege. So um, when having this, this time that I wanted to put together, cause I had never seen a, a panel of all black women speaking on brain injury. Um, and I knew there was no one in the world more than I wanted than you to do it NECA. But I, you know, I had to line everybody up cause I knew you were so busy and so many things that people want you to do. So I knew as soon as you met these amazing women, um, so first, the first panel was the, uh, the women with the lived experiences. Do you have any thoughts that any more that you want to share on working with that group? And that video actually is now premiered on the pink concussions video. So, uh, YouTube channel. So after this call, you can watch the panel that we're speaking about. Yeah, I would encourage everybody to watch it. And once you watch it once, you're going to watch it again, because Honestly, I, I had goosebumps. We'd met a couple of times, Catherine, you know this, right? There, was, there were the planning uh, conversations and I knew in speaking as a group and sort of trying to pass out, understand what each part of each panelist wanted to um, spotlight. There were certain themes that kept on coming up, right? Um, one of the critical ones that's heartbreaking is how the, the medical profession discounts and doesn't believe black women right so you you know you're making it up you're it's not as bad as as it is and and referring you to the next person who refers you to the next person so black women in trauma and you know um 
their lives being upended by this injury, this serious injury, to then have it compounded, right? There were layers of the racism. It was heartbreaking. It was heartbreaking to hear. But then what the magic for me was about, Catherine, you talk about the resilience, the resilience of these panelists, the, the advocacy that they had to do for themselves, right? And then also understanding that they weren't just doing it for themselves, they were advocating for other black women that were following behind who would have brain, who have brain injuries. So it what what really moved me was how in the trauma, it's similar to survivors that I, I, I work with, members of the organization, that those of us who have lived it in our own trauma, we're still thinking about others. And we're still thinking about how do we make it better, different outcome for other people who we know are following. And so I, I just, I was, I was just overwhelmed by, with gratitude for them. And I remember, um, I think it was Divine who was the, she talked about the, um, she was a survivor of intimate partner violence and actually sustained her brain injury through the violence of her, her, her ex. And again, heartbreaking that she didn't have the types of supports for intimate partner violence because people would, when she went to the hospital, I remember this, the, the eye roll, you know, that as if it was her fault that she was abused. And I thought, where on earth is the human compassion in people? Where is the kindness in people that somebody's come in front of you and needs help? And instead of doing what you are paid to do, you are going to sit and victim blame. You're, you're going to sit and judge and make somebody in trauma jump hoops. I, I, I just, I couldn't fathom, I couldn't fathom, but I know it happens. I know it happens. I hear it all the bloody time, but it was the resilience of the panelists and their determination and their refusal to sit down and take it that made me think, holy smokes, this is what, this is what power looks like. And uh, Deneen, would you like to, to uh, speak now? Is Deneen on the call? Deneen is on the call. I think what, what? under my name. I'm looking yes. for Yes. 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 Hello, I my lovely. How are you? <laughs> Hello, Hi, lovely. Hello, my yes. love. Oh, there you are. Yes. I have my lights on because you give me power. And I'm so thankful that I was a part of that great discussion with a group of women. And I have to tell you, for the first time, my voice was heard. The first time my voice was heard, yes, 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 yes. And I'm getting some red nail polish too and my red lipstick because <laughs> we got more work to do. But I'm just thankful. And I just wanted to come on to say thank you for giving me that opportunity. Thank you to Catherine and King Concussions. What an honor it is. Do I wish this did not happen to me? Of course, I wish I didn't have a brain injury. However, guess what? I'm stepping up, I'm showing up, and I'm not shutting up because I'm going to help other people to have better lives. Together, we are truly strong. I am thankful I met you and thankful that I ride now with a group of powerful individuals that will speak up for me and show up for me. So namaste, my sister. I thank you for what you do. And I love that you're here today. And I'm so proud and happy to be a part you. of this. I love you. I love you. Love and you I'm too. so glad. I, I, I talk about how my gratitude to the goddesses for bringing us all together. So yeah, so good to see you. Powerful we queens. To, Very nice to see you as well. Thank you. And Danina, nope, no, no, come back here, Danine. <laughs> Come back here. Video back on. Uh, Deneen, I'm trying. Deneen is the newest, one of their newest board member on Pink Concussions, which I think is the most important thing that she does. No, you, Deneen does so many things. Would you just, uh, you know, just explain who you are uh, and the different hats you wear? I don't know if you can see me. I'm having trouble with my screen. You know, I yeah, we can see you. Yeah, see. You. Oh, oh. Um, I work at a college and I help students with disabilities. I'm so proud to be in this role to listen 
and be present to hear and look at assessment because you can read an assessment tool, but until you hear the true story and voice of the person to put pieces together to, to, to develop a plan for college. And it certainly has been a complex plan with COVID. So I'm an accessibility coordinator. I am an advocate. I'm a counselor. I'm a professor. I am always an individual who will stand up for my students and listen. So my roles are expansive and um, that can be draining. And it reminds me of self-care, which is why I reach out to you, Catherine, sometimes to say, hey, um, I pushed a little bit too hard this week. What do I need to do? And you are a constant reminder to take care of myself. So I thank you for that. Oh, you are huge love in my life. Um, also central um, New York brain. I didn't mention that. So I am the president of the president of central New York brain injury coalition. And I am in the process of returning to school to complete my doctoral degree. And it will be really, I thought a lot about how I want to incorporate social justice and leadership into that and looking at workplace and um, the voices of women that are black and in toxic environments that microaggressions and gaslighting happen. So I'm really interested in, in incorporating those tools in my repertoire of things that I do to help give back. And for me, giving back is important and definitely my faith always guides me for sure. Thank you so much, Deneen. And, and Deneen tells her story in, in the, the panel that we just launched, but I don't know if you could just give us those few minute, minutes when you were in the ER after your accident and seen as one person and then the student came in and, and recognized you as another. Yeah, um, I have to say, I always felt like, I, I suffer from vertigo, one of the, the results from this, this accident and hitting my head. And um, there were multiple times that I would go from ambulance to the hospital and I would be pushed in the hallway, just sitting in the hallway and not getting care. And people that would come in afterwards would often get care and treatment very quickly. However, there was one time when one of my students saw me, the ER was filled, I was vomiting. I was vomiting. <laughs> in the hallway on a stretcher and brought in by an ambulance and people just were walking by nurses, doctors, all these medical care people. And it took one student who had graduated and saw me and said, professor, and the entire nurses station, I will never forget this. They all turned around to look, including the doctor who finally came over to get me care. And why should I have to have privilege by my education, privilege by being called professor, privilege by being in a position of having someone on the inside to pull me up, it's wrong. So that's why this is so important to me. I think that um, the systemic changes that need to happen, I, I am glad that we have allies. So I'm thankful for you. I'm thankful for NECA and the work that you do. And I hear too many stories that need to be stopped by women that are in, in LGBTQ populations that are in abusive relationships. So that's one reason why I do what I do. And that's just- And I don't know if that- That's just one, you know, that's just literally the 20 seconds of, you know, a whole story that I really, that, that I encourage um, people to, to watch. And- in putting this together, I knew I wanted a group of women like Deneen to share the lived experience. And then I also wanted, I'd seen a, um, uh, and I'll put it in the link, um, uh, a PowerPoint on the African-American male and basically the TB high rehab, you're most likely for TB rehab, go to prison than you will be to actually go. But I didn't even, I didn't see any research on black women. There was just this one slide deck on black men. So I started thinking about um, the different patients that had said, you know, we wanted to see someone that looked like us and rehab professionals and black rehab professionals. And Monique had 
it's so I think spoken at almost every pain concussions we've ever had and and then found this group of black rehab professionals to put together who I thought were going to talk about the research or the lack of research and then figured got them all lined up and just poured NECA in and then said they're two hours by and NECA tell us what that those two panels ended up being yeah that again the only word I I really have to describe it it was magic it was magical because and I it, I'd said it initially or earlier on around what happens when black women get together, right? And, and the sisterhood that automatically surfaces. And in that sisterhood, there is a level of comfort that you feel you can be your true self because you feel safer in each other's arms, right? In each other's company. And so whilst the second panel was sort of Initially, when Catherine and I were speaking about it, 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 it had a very professional lean, right? We're going to talk about academia and, but once we got together and the sisterhood opened, the panelists started sharing their personal, right? Their, their, I call it truth telling. They were telling their truth about their experiences in academia and how anti-black racism and specifically um, misogynoir, right, anti-Black racism against Black women, plays out in academia. So trying to get tenured track is a, a near impossibility. Trying to get recognized for the types of research that you want to do, again, that centers bodies that look like yours, gets sidelined and, and people try to force you to do research into areas that they think is important. So that, that conversation, which I knew, I knew, I knew existed because I've spoken to other black women in the Canadian context, in the UK about similar experiences, but it never ceases to upset and shock me every time I hear it. Because you know, people like to think that we are post uh, racism, that this is a, 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 we're all divert, we're all accepting in Canada and in the, no such thing, there's still, embedded anti-black racism, white supremacy, you're gonna name it, white supremacy is still controlling the narrative. And that white supremacy is not only harming, you know, the, the, the people that it others, black, indigenous, trans, does, it doesn't just harm them, it harms the people in power who you lose sight of your humanity, right? Deneen's experiences being on a gurney Right in a hospital, with, with the, it is about healthcare. They're supposed to be supported. She's on a gurney, she's vomiting, and these healthcare professionals don't see her, or they refuse to see her. So to me, the system, right, is broken, and beyond being broken, it's actually, it's actually not bloody broken. It was designed this way. The system is doing what it was meant to do, which is. It, it's not a, it's not a, what my, my kid would say, it's not a, it's not a, a bug. It's a feature of the system that it, it, it excludes and ignores and, and, you know, silences and erases. It's deliberately doing that. And I think that people who have lost touch with their humanity are the ones who uphold this, these injustices. I really, really believe that. And so speaking to the academics, the individuals who are the professionals, in that capacity and having them sort of expose their experiences to me was anybody who listened, they needed, you, you know, you bow, right? And acknowledge the brilliance and the courage that it takes to speak your truth and be damned with it. So yeah, it was, it was, it was an honor. It was an honor and a privilege for me, Catherine, honestly. And the, the, there's two hours of that particular content. Um, we have just published the first hour of the P P women with lived experience and we've just published uh, one hour and we're going to hold for a month the second hour um there i tried to come up with some bullet points to describe that hour and i i can't but it's uh monique and Kelly talking about, you know, their experiences, the people that, you know, advice to other black rehab women professionals coming up, allies, um, the need for research, 
of for how in the cases they were saying how blacks black patients integrate back into the community and what factors you're looking at and um just so many and calls to action so i just really would love if you put some some time aside to to listen to the so many things that were said they were gems there were some really really beautiful and they were practical stuff right it wasn't it wasn't pie in the sky and i don't think any any ask is a pie in the sky but it wasn't it wasn't unachievable lofty you know types of aspirational things that people just okay that that that's a nice to have and then you you move on these are practical tangible things that everybody can do everybody can do everybody should be doing in order to create a better outcome for you know black and when i think about black i i'm also cognizant that it, it's the same for indigenous indigenous women right two, two spirit lgbtq uh, communities it, it's we are experiencing that othering right which means that our our the outcomes for us of a brain injury is radically different than the outcomes for white women and just in the small amount of evolution that that I've gone through in the last couple of years. Um, reading Medical Apartheid was a life-changing book yeah. for me. Um, if you haven't read Medical Apartheid, I, I can't think of a book that's changed changed more my view on the on on this. But there's so many moments that have come up as a white woman on a call generally with all other white people in brain injury that I can just say, whether it's a national TBI call or a local call, just say, hey, you know, you know, look, you know, this is an entire group of people that all look alike. How are, you know, if, 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 if there's no diversity in the leadership, how can there be any diversity in what we're doing and the need to make sure that communities that haven't yet had the opportunity for, you know, research, assessment, um, identification, uh, rehab outcomes that, that it's, it's so easy to, to jump into those spaces and throw out the conversation, um, you know, and, and those opportunities were probably available to me, you know, Bef multiple times that I just didn't realize that it was literally opening my mouth to step in and say something. Yeah, I, I, and again, I, I don't believe in my other life, I do um, consulting on EDI, equity, diversity, and inclusion. And my team and I on in that work, we go into these traditionally white run organizations, oftentimes legacy, or institutions, oftentimes, you know, for-profit, large corporations. And we, we have something called uh, the, a CALP analysis, color of the workplace, CALP analysis, which is basically look at the hierarchies. So you look at the CEO, the VPs, the directors, the managers, and at what point in that hierarchy do you start seeing black women? And usually it's sort of, you know, coordinator, maybe supervisor and, and below. And yet you, you ask yourself, especially for these organizations that are creating programming for communities of, of, of color, what are you doing when you're, oh, it's like asking a man to tell me about sanitary uh, products. What, what are we doing? What are we doing? You need to ask the people who have the lived experience, who know about that, to be co-creating. Like I love the, what you said, Catherine. It is about co-creating, but you have to center the lived experiences of those individuals. You have to center. And I, I, I was saying that I don't, I don't judge anybody for not knowing, but once you know, then I'm gonna judge you for what are you doing? Now you know, what are you doing? Um, now love, you know how are you showing up? Love Your Brain is an organization that started about maybe a couple of year, maybe a year behind us. And it's Kevin Pierce. It's a, a family in Vermont. He was a snowboarder. He had a movie called Crash Reel and they opened Love Your Brain. And they've sort of focused on yoga 
um, for people with TBI. That's that's their space, and everything is very beautiful. It's a lovely space, and uh, they just put out their uh, DEI statement, and it's I, I think it's amazing. And through their statement, I've found their consultants, and we're on that pathway to create ours. And I'm reaching out to other brain injury organizations and saying, you know. Where is your, you know, have you done a diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging statement? Where are you on that pathway? And I said on a national call today, I said, we're working on this. We're, you know, hiring some consultants. Um, you know, if any other brain injury organizations is also on that path, wouldn't it be, you know, join us and let's do a workshop together. Um, so um, yeah, I put that up there. Uh and it leads to other people. It leads to this um, amazing woman, uh, black yoga, black meditation. Um, so that's what great. And then there's another movie, a, a movie I just put up there about a uh, hospital in St. Louis from 1937 to uh, 1979 that happened to start and become a, a segregated hospital. But in watching that video, you see uh, operating room where it's all, you know, all black, black surgeon, black nurses, black patients. And this hospital trained um, a, a third of all of the black doctors and nurses in the country. And it, it, and it was shut down in 1979 at 530 in the morning by police with dogs and horses. And there's a whole story about that. So I want to throw that in there. I also want to acknowledge Linda Locke, another amazing, amazing gift in my life. And I follow her on LinkedIn and I've gotten so much yummy stuff from, and from the maternal um, and infant and midwife space. And I asked the dumbest midwife questions the first time I talked to her, I do hope she forgives me, but how much in the maternal midwife space, and I've been going to, uh, to webinars, guess what? It's the same thing. It's the same stuff. So Linda, do you want to make a comment to? Yeah, and hi, thanks, Catherine. <laughs> Catherine is, is convinced that we're related, which is, you know, like entirely possible. We um, have the same last name and- uh, yeah, We both somehow have the same last name and part of our names. So she's, she's convinced we're related and who knows, you, you know? Look at me. Obviously, it could be possible. So, <laughs> right? Um, so yeah. So I'm I'm a midwife and a social worker, and I work in ma maternal morbidity and mortality space a lot. But I also work in um, domestic and sexual violence and brain injury and that. And and there's so many correlations. I mean, you know, some of the things that you say about not being seen, not being heard, not being listened to are exactly, I mean, if you look at any of the, um, videos about, uh, put out recently about black maternal mortality, it is exactly the same thing. Serena Williams, right? I mean, we're, you know, not being listened to, not being acknowledged. Um, our, Department of Health, or the, the person who was the prior Department of Health uh, head in New Jersey, where, I, where I'm located, um, talks about as a medical student, he's a physician, as a medical student being told by the resident, oh, go into this room and evaluate this patient. You know, she's probably a drug, a, seeking drugs uh, because it was a young Black woman, right? And she was in sickle cell crisis, right? Just, just that assumption about people um, that are black, indigenous, brown, that, and female, especially, you know, and I'm talking about, yes, that the, the intersectionality, absolutely all of our identities that aren't recognized. Um, so yes, yeah, so the work that I'm doing is trying to work on healthcare professionals to get them into a better space about recognizing um, not only the humanity and, and, and the importance of listening to people and honoring people, but but just understanding the prevalence of domestic and sexual violence and the intersection with TBI and yada, 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 yada. And that they're seeing these people, yep, yep, Deneen, they're seeing people all the time and never asking the right questions, right? So, I mean, we all know this, right? And, and so, yeah, it's just, it's really been, been um, 
great to find this space and be able to, you know, like be in sync with so many people. So I just thank you. And then you just have to let people know who your dad is since I'm partway through the book. <laughs> so my dad was a Tuskegee Airman. His name is John Sloan. And uh, yeah, he wrote a book, um, which I send to Catherine. And uh, cause she's got Sloan in her name somewhere. And so she's convinced, like I said, she's convinced we're related, so who knows? Uh, so you can find, you can Google him and see, um, you know, see some information. He was, he was shot down over Italy and uh, his story is really, you know, there's, there's a, there's a pieces of it that still make me angry now about like how he came back and here he is with all his medals and his full uniform and a brace that I remember finding that brace in the garage and I don't even, I couldn't even pick it up. I don't know how he he wore it because it was remember this was pre-aluminum so it was so steel and it was heavy and it went from his rib cage all the way down his legs so he had this brace and he's got his uniform over it and he's using two canes and he you know has to go to the back of the bus um many things like that in the book about you know how how he struggled uh the struggles that he went through but yeah so that's what i think about when um yeah yeah, so that's that's what I think about when I when I say, oh, this is too hard. And I'm like, really, really lock, you know, like it's like, <laughs> like, get a grip, get a grip. <laughs> your dad, would, what would your dad say to you right now? Like, mm, yeah, this, is, this ain't nothing. Yeah, there's daddy. There's yeah, dad. yeah, yeah, yeah. He's going on the plane with me tonight to L.A. Uh... I'm ordering it as soon as this is done on Amazon. I don't <laughs> Bezos doesn't need any more money, but I think your family does. Yeah, so I'm I'm, I'm doing it. He's so it, <laughs> if you if you can't, so I don't know. I know there's a bunch of copies out there, and I know you can get it on Amazon. But if anybody has trouble getting it, my brother has a whole ton in his garage. So mm. you can <laughs> you can email me, and I can get you a copy if you can't find it. If you have any trouble finding it, just let me know. Beautiful. So I really look, you know, and, 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 and that my mind sometimes just explodes when I think of the, you know, the, just the whole cycle of, of what I'm learning about maternal and family and, and infants and, and marriage and domestic violence and like the whole, the, the whole, it, it's all interconnected. It almost just seems awkward and weird that we're in these silos because it all, the cross section of it all. Um, so I am so honored to have this space where we can just, you know, share on these pieces. So Linda's amazing. And um, Linda, you want to give the, uh, just your website? Please. Well, well, the website is, is kind of like not really real yet. So it's there, but it's just a very baby, steps kind of thing. So um, it's New Jersey Healthcare is about um, domestic and sexual violence collaborative. And you can check out our Facebook page, which probably has more information on it than the website does yet. But what is the website, Catherine? You made it for me. I can't even remember what it is. I'll put it in the <laughs> chat. I'll put it in the chat. We got to finish that website too. Um, I know it needs work. It needs work. I keep getting emails from like, you know, people who say, oh, I've, you know, like, oh, I've seen your website and I could do so much with it, you know, because they want me to pay them money to fix yeah. it. But yeah, hey, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm free. You can't be free. I know. Um, so uh, I, I just can't wait till that we all can get into a space and we can just all spend a weekend together because it just yeah, love I know, right? connecting with everybody. So I want to thank you, Linda, Deneen, for jumping on. Uh, Neka, totally love you, and I'm just so excited that I'm in a, in your crush with Angela and Lynn. Um, great women too. So, um, and, and you and I have never even had a meal together. We've run by each other in conferences, and uh, we gave an award to Neka, and she sent her children because she was at the UN. <laughs> Ooh, and. Uh, I, you know, to meet somebody's children before you actually meet the mom and her kids were amazing, made us all cry. So delicious.
delicious. They're delicious, so. they are. My son just got married um, recently. I know. Wow, congratulations. I know. I know, I know. It's wonderful. They're the reason why we do this work. But yeah. It's true. Well, I love you all and everybody stay safe. I am actually going, uh, I can't read all the chats. Uh, uh, I am going to the Super Bowl, which the only part I'm going to is there's a brain injury summit on Saturday. And I'm going to the Brain Health Summit, Elise Steinbrenner's, and then on the first plane out Sunday morning. And somebody had to tell me today who was playing in the Super Bowl because I had no idea. So, <laughs> but if there's a brain summit, I'll go. So uh, everybody have a, a safe week. And we just have, I think we have 10 other episodes planned. It's amazing people to share with you. And thank you, NECA. And that's it. Everybody yeah. have a have a great week. Stay Thank safe, you. everyone. Thank you all Bye. so much. Bye. Bye. Thank you.